Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Dulce Guzman, and I am the Executive Director of Alianza Americas. Um, today, we are honored to welcome you to Voices That Matter, the fight for linguistic access for indigenous migrant communities, a conversation co-organized alongside Comunidades Indígenas en Liderazgo, Cielo, in California, and Red de Pueblos Transnacionales in New York, both member organizations of our network. This event will be conducted in Spanish and English. If you prefer to listen in to the conversation in just one language, you can activate the interpretation feature in your preferred language by clicking on the interpretation icon at the bottom right corner of your Zoom screen. This event is part of the Mirta Colon Permanent Seminar, a space dedicated to reflecting on the impact of racism on indigenous and Afro-descendant communities. We reiterate our belief that having an understanding of history and the... Necesitamos conocer nuestra historia y entender las raíces de discriminación y racismo, tanto en nuestros países de origen como aquí en Estados Unidos, nos empodere y nos impulsa a actuar para superar inequidades. Hoy... ...for language rights and the vital work interpreters do for indigenous and Afro-descendant communities. Interpreters play a fundamental role in preserving their languages and ensuring access to essential rights for their communities, both in their countries of origin and in migratory contexts. Our guests, women interpreters of indigenous languages, will share their experiences and the challenges they face in promoting language access in critical areas such as health, justice, health, justice, and education. This is a unique opportunity to learn from those who work tirelessly for language justice every day. Today, we are joined by Aurora Pedro, who will moderate this important discussion. Aurora Pedro is a queer Maya, Acateco, and Panjobal from San Miguel Acatán and Santa Eloal Eulalia, Huehuetango, Guatemala. She is the manager of the Center for Indigenous Languages and Power at Comunidades Indígenas and Liderazgo. Aurora co-facilitates Cielo's cultural sensitivity workshops with a focus on language diversity and migration patterns by looking at the root and historical context of displacements of Maya communities from Guatemala. Her passions include advocating for linguistic rights and connecting with indigenous migrant communities. Aurora was the former Los Angeles Sumac de, de, de Ixim, San Miguel Acatán, as the elected representative of the Acateco Migueleño community in Los Angeles, California. She is also a trained interpreter and, my, and multilingual in English, Acateco, Conjubal, and she incorporates these language skills in her work as a doula for Acateco and Conjubal parents and helps them navigate the healthcare industry. Aurora continues to develop her skills to assist indigenous communities and fight for linguistic rights. Thank you so much, Aurora, for being here. The mic is yours. Thank you so much, Hazel, for that introduction. Um, and I'm excited to be here with everyone and be able to have a conversation with our guests for today. And um, I, the participants that we have for today is Josefina Prudente, a Nasavi woman. Josefina migrated to New York, where she worked as a domestic worker while facing language barriers. Uh, over time, she managed to learn English and driven by injustices she observed towards migrants and indigenous women. Currently, she is a law student at UNAM, focused on defending women's rights, especially in the fight against gender violence. Since participating in the International Indigenous Women's Leadership Forum, in 2020, she has continued to work to empower Indigenous women. Claudia Lambart is our other participant, a Garifuna woman and Honduran lawyer. Her native language is Honduran Garifuna. Claudia is part of the Colibri Collective in New York, here in the United States, and is co-founder of the Afro-Descendant Women's Association with offices in New York and Honduras. And we're so grateful to be here, to have you here today to discuss the struggles for language rights, language access for indigenous migrant communities all around. Um, so just a reminder, this event will be conducted in Spanish and English. And for your convenience, you can enable the interpretation feature in the preferred language at the bottom right corner of your Zoom screen. Um, so for today, we have a couple of questions prepared for 
our guests here, Josefina and Claudia, and after we'll open it up to the audience. So um, for the first question for Josefina and Claudia, I'd like to ask you uh, from your experience, what are the biggest challenges indigenous communities face in teaching their languages to new generations and maintaining them when they migrate? Um, feel free, uh, Josefina, let's start with you. Sí, buenas, buenos días. Mi nombre es Josefina Prudente. Yes, good morning. My name is Josefina Prudente from the Chapatagua Guatemala community. And I'm very happy to be here with you to be able to share a little about, about the needs of today. Well, one of the challenges that, that I found to be able to teach our children living in a country like this one has been time. We know that in the system that we live in, it is a globalized system. We have to work to be able to pay our rent. In, in California and New York, it has been one of the states that has been where rent is very, very expensive. And we have to understand that nowadays, the woman has been a part of that family support, the mutual family support between where man and woman have to work to be able to, and have to leave their home. So many times the children, the new generation that have been born here in the U.S., they have to leave their homes to go to another community where they're a daycare or a school. And this is where this communication between mother and child breaks because in in one's country, the children, the people have their children with them until they're five, six years and they begin their elementary education. But here they have to depend on these institutions so the children can be taken care of while one works. Another one of the things that has always, while discrimination has always existed, and as an indigenous person, we understand that we have to learn a language, the language that is spoken in that country for us to adapt and fit in this new system that's been imposed on us because, of course, we are clear that we are here because of forced migration, and it's not as if we could, we had the pleasure of migrating. So seeing everything from this point of view, we have to know how do we find the means to be able to teach our children these languages. However, in Mexico, as well as here, this tragedies have not been an, an education plan has not been extended for us to be able to work with our children. We're talking about people that we have that intention of teaching our children not only the oral and written language, but the people that we have to work. Obviously, we're going to forget this. We're going to leave this behind. If we don't have that intention of wanting to teach our children, this is going to be left behind. In my work as um, in order to be able to preserve the language and culture, we've been working here in New York with an organization called ELA, where we go once a week to be able to teach our children to our, teach our language to our children. But just like ELA, more spaces should be able to be open for us to work with our children. We understand that many Nasavis, we don't know how to write our language, but we also have to have that obligation as as mothers to induce within our children to speak our language, to teach them to not be ashamed of our language. And there's a very interesting part that Mexico, which should be the country that should be most interested in having more, more materials in the original languages, they don't have it. So I think that from that point forward, we have to change that and demand that Mexico has more material to work with our children. If we, when they want to read our book to our children, we don't have the material available for us. There is a law that exists 
this from 2019 that backs up this plan. However, it's only a something written in the Constitution. There's not something real or a strategy that's actually being implemented. And we hope that with this new government, we see a true push for the public education secretary to implement this material and a commitment from the Nasavi community to continue speaking in our language. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josefina, for that um, detailed response. I think I really appreciate the perspective of really underlying how society discriminates against Indigenous people. It's not that Indigenous people are um, no longer teaching the language, no longer speaking the language. And that really shows, right, because at the end of the day, um, it looks like it's the family. It's the families that are putting in a lot of the efforts to continue um, the language, their culture, especially in an environment that uh, just continues to discriminate against Indigenous people. Um, and let's move on with Claudia from your experience. What are the biggest challenges uh, you your community faces in teaching their languages to the new generation and maintaining um, their language when they migrate? Sí, buenos días a todos. Es un placer, un privilegio. Yes, good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here with everybody to share some of our knowledge. My name is Claudia Lambert, Honduran, born in the United States in Florida, but currently I'm in Honduras. I'm a lawyer by trade. As, as mentioned previously. Based on my experience, one of the challenges faced by the indigenous communities to teach these languages to the generations and maintain them when they migrate, there are several challenges. For example, I've considered that some of the most important ones are the ones going to mention right now. One of them is the lack of awareness to maintain the language and recognize that the language is the essence and the foundation for any com indigenous community, which is the way we transmit knowledge, customs, our worldview from generation to generation, and this, this way we maintain our culture alive, regardless of the country where we're located in at that moment. It's another thing that I consider important is the lack of willingness from the government to provide follow-up, like in our case in Honduras, some years ago, they implement a intercultural bilingual study plan. This was developed in some communities, but because of some, because of lack of willpower from the government, this project this program has been discontinued. The other issue that I consider important is the lack of programs where they can develop projects where the issue of these projects is the importance of conserving this language and teaching the Garifuna language where mothers are involved since these are the ones that spend the most amount of time with children and we are the ones that have that ability to be able to transmit this knowledge so that this Garifuna language is preserved regardless if, if the people are in Honduras or in another country, regardless of the circumstances of where the mother is located, those are the most important issues. The challenges that I could identify regarding, regarding the first question. Thank you so much, Claudia. Um, I think that was really important to to highlight the lack of the lack of awareness, the lack of recognizing indigenous languages. I think not just here in the United States, but in in the country of origin as well, plays an important factor in that. Um, so for the next question, we have. Um, we have, as we've heard Josefina and Claudia share about the different uh, discrimination that indigenous people face and um, especially in a society where monolingualism is encouraged, um, for instance, an environment where most services are in either Spanish or English, uh, how can we ensure access for peoples from indigenous 
communities who prefer to speak their language or they're not fluent in Spanish or English. Um, let's start with Claudia this time. Oh, My Claudia, apologies. your mic is... Okay. Entorno en donde la mayoría de los servicios son en español. An environment where the majority of services are in Spanish and English. The way we can guarantee that people have access. No sé si me escuchan. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. La forma como podemos garantizar el acceso a los indígenas. The way we can... Guarantee access to indigenous migrants in the services so that they can feel comfortable by providing skilled people to provide a specialized translation service that they require since it's a protected right internationally. For example, the right to the free access to information. We have immigrant indigenous immigrants. This has been assessed by the institutions that are in charge of protecting, guaranteeing the human rights who have recognized the fundamental right to the, the nature of the right and the necessity for it to be expressly protected by the laws created so for this right to be respected and also to be implemented in practice. These are many institutions that I could mention regarding the Human Rights, International Human Rights Commission, the United, United Nations Commission, among others. Thank you so much, Claudia. And for Josefina, uh, how do you perceive this? Um, how can we ensure access for peoples from indigenous community who prefer their language or if they're not fluent in English or Spanish? Um, how can they access these services if it's mainly in Spanish or English? In my case, as an activist, when it comes to linguistic, I think it's very important that from where we are to raise our voices to the governments and the government institutions as well, that this is a necessity, a primary necessity for the indigenous communities who live outside of their country, including those who live in their country of origin, to receive this service. And it's their rights, these are human rights, that they are granted a, an interpretation in their native language. Many times as indigenous people, we think that we are begging for something from the government or that we don't deserve that service. And this is why many times we don't ask for it because we think that we're causing, we're bothering them or disturbing them. However, we have to understand that the rights demand and that we have to ask for the service. But when this service doesn't exist, for example, here in the state of New York, you don't see this, including in schools. We realize that they don't have this interpretation service. These are great, these are serious circumstances for our children. They don't receive the proper treatment. We don't receive the proper services. So they are violating not only the service, the interpretation service, but as well as other rights that belong to human rights, for example, right for health, right for well-being, the right for even for food. Many times our, our fellow countrymen, they don't have coupons because they haven't been able to have that interpretation of how to apply that information in their original language. So we think that we have to make use of any forum where we can raise our voice and demand from the state it's demand from our leaders that are here to protect our rights to face these problems. But at the same time, it's important for us to raise our voice and raise awareness among our people to that they have to demand that they know that there is a necessity. Thank you, Josefina. Um, I think I heard from both Claudia and Josefina really emphasizing that this is a right. Um, it's not a burden. It's not something that um, if someone 
might be able to just uh, understand a little bit of a language, but that this is a right to speak in your indigenous language and that it's a necessity and that um, indigenous people have a right to these service in their languages. And I think this um, is really important, especially when it comes to uh, health, um, immigration cases and the justice system. So uh, Josefina and Claudia, I know as interpreters and as indigenous women, how do you see how this impacts indigenous people, um, their ability to be able to communicate, to express themselves in their in their native, in their mother tongue, um, when they're trying to access um, healthcare systems or their immigration matters or the justice system. Um, let's start with you, Josefina. Well, one of the biggest impacts that or consequences that this way of not knowing or not, be, not being able to continue to communicate in their maternal language when it comes to health, you could see consequences in their very health. We've seen in hospitals that they've done, there have been unnecessary C-sections have been performed because of the lack of interpretation. We've seen how people have been deported because, because of the lack of this right. We've seen how justice, there are many people, many of our people have been jailed because they don't have this interpretation, which is very necessary. And we return to original point violating their rights because it's important to have this information information in their language. So I think it's an impact for them to have this repression, to not be able to express themselves in their maternal language, what they want to say in order to defend themselves, what they want to say to, to not do an unnecessary issue in their cases. Like in my case, I've seen a number of cases in which they've always where children's and women's rights and elderly people's rights have been violated and then they're a vulnerable part of our society. So I think it's very important if, if this would be very necessary, such as our, our meal to have a roof over our heads. It's always important. It's also important to have information in our language and also important to defend ourselves in our language language or the due process in the the justice sector or the migration area. Thank you, Josefina. Um, I think you touched upon something that a lot of interpreters um, for indigenous languages encounter where, um, especially in the healthcare system, where a simple phrase, a simple word can be misunderstood. So how is it that someone can advocate for themselves. Like you said, someone can defend themselves if they don't understand the language that's being spoken. And is it really waiving their right if they don't understand what the rights are in that, um, not only that language, but the worldview? Um, and Claudia, I'm curious to know for Garifuna and your work, how have you um, seen this impact indigenous people when it comes to them accessing healthcare, immigration system and the justice system? Yes, from our perspective, it's a strong impact besides the migratory results or the request for health services. The Justice Administration, we can also see that the impact in the emotional aspect of our of our country, our, our fellow brothers and sisters who migrate. So it's important to have a person that has broad knowledge in the maternal language to provide the service as an interpreter and to guarantee their the rights of our brothers and sisters when they have to migrate when it comes to whether administering justice or the health services, for there to be a due process, because sometimes due to not be able to transmit or relate the what happened, an issue might be expedited or they might be granted what they truly need or what they're requesting the exact opposite might, might happen 
or when it comes to accessing any type of procedure that they need for adaptation when they arrive a new, into a new country like the United States. Thank you, Claudia. I've We've seen that many times actually happen here, right? Where um, the justice system really fails indigenous people when a language barrier is not recognized. And sometimes not only is it a violation of their rights, but it causes them more harm. Um, and that's something that's really important to know, especially in the justice system. And um, my next question, it's going to be two parts. So um, feel free to answer the second or first part first. Um, so how does language justice in your country of origin for people who belong to your community, how, how does that work? And for the second part of the question, what good practice have you observed or want to highlight to promote language justice? And how can these initiatives be expanded in other countries or other contexts. Um, let's go with you, Josefina. Well, I think this is a bit more complex than one might believe. Linguistic justice in Mexico, we know that there's always been, we've always known that if I was to function that those that work as voluntary interpreters don't have rights. However, in the United States, we do have those rights and we have to exercise this work professionally. So I think that in this case, in, from, in the case of Mexico, to expand from Mexico to the US on this side, we have to expand the knowledge that we've acquired so that our original communities do receive this linguistic justice in a, a way that is in the correct fashion. Because maybe the fact that we are volunteers or volunteer interpreters, we feel that. So, I think that of this work, of this work as an interpreter, is a work with like that as just like any other professional because we have received the proper training to do so. So the way that we've worked to as of now, in my case, I've received training in different areas thanks to Cielo, and also when we have done training from other organizations, I've tried to attend in order to receive my training. So. If we make a comparison with Mexico, in Mexico, we've yet to receive this formal training for interpreters that are adequate, that are prepared to do this interpretation. On, when it comes to the other thing, I think that it's important for us how can we promote this linguistic justice? For example, here in the state of New York, we formed a collective called Colibri. I'm a co-founder of Colibri since, since the year 2000, and we work tirelessly to raise the voice to leaders, to institutions, that it's important to have the service in all areas, in any place. It's important to provide the service, but I think it's also important to have the spaces. And this is where we should, the institutions should support us, those institutions that are interested for justice to be served as it should be. But it's also it's also the responsibility of the interpreters to receive the proper training, to be loyal to their ideology, to impart a service that is that is good, that is the willingness to do so, that comes from the consciousness to do a good to provide service in order to serve their own communities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Josefina, for mentioning that. I think as interpreters, um, especially in countries that might not recognize our language, like, for example, here in the U.S., 
our languages aren't recognized. Um, so it's really important that we as interpreters have followed the code of ethics and that we are trained and we continue the training um, because at the end of the day, we're doing this for the communities. We're doing this to make sure that the access um, to their language, to information um, is being bridged. Um, and that's something that will really highlight how we can implement this in different places, like the language access. Um, and there's so many different languages, um, indigenous languages. So thank you so much, Josefina, for that. And for Claudia, I'm curious to know about, um, for your community, if you've, um, how does the language justice system, how does the lang uh, language justice work in your country of origin? Um, and are there any observed best practices in Honduras? Claudia, I think your mic's Claudia. on me. Claudia? When we talk about linguistic justice, we are talking about the respect that is, that is due to our language. And they say that, that there should be no reason for which a language is considered superior than another one, regardless of its or where it comes and the knowledge that we have. So when we apply to our country, my country, Honduras, the level of respect that we have to our language, from my perspective, from my point of view, has been well represented, has, has not been well represented from the moment that our government, as I mentioned previously, or by means of a decree, they accepted that, they accepted the implementation of this and imparting this class in our school rooms for our children of the communities. So from that point of view, we're seeing that the government is accepting, is respecting our language in our country. The second question is, what good practices can, can be observed or highlighted when, when it comes to linguistic justice with the government of the Republic? I consider that one of the good practices would be the continuance of these classes in the school room because we will be guaranteeing that our future generations are going to be learning, are going to be practicing the Garifuna language and this way we can ensure that they it is, is preserved from generation to future generations. I love that, Claudia, that, you know, it really being able to um, honor these rights is a form of respecting these languages. And um, in order to continue this, um, especially for future generations, there needs to be a way that we can have these classrooms be sustainable. Um, so thank you so much for that. And I think for here, we can open up the, the questions to the audience from the audience. Uh, it looks like we have someone who is asking, how open are young people to learning their native languages? Are they involved? So uh, Josefina or Claudia, would any of you like to answer that question um, regarding young people? If you've seen that they're open to learning their language, are they involved in learning their language? When it comes to Honduras and the Garifuna language, there are young people that are interested, especially when they, when they have to migrate, they realize the importance of having, having their own language to be able to identify themselves, to have their way of expressing themselves in a different way compared to everybody else. However, there's another group that they consider that they have little interest or maybe they see other languages are more interesting than their own languages. Eh, disculpe, ¿podría repetir la pregunta, por favor? My apologies, can you please repeat the question? Yeah, of course. Um, how open have you seen, if at all, young people to learning their native language? And are they involved in that process? 
Bueno, nosotros, como vuelvo a mencionar, tenemos Well, aquí hay as una I mentioned again, en lengua here que tiene lenguas en peligro de extinción, we have eh, an organization Brasil called Sonora, ELA, eh, que eh, Language está in Danger en of Extinction. Es West de la 17, It's in que ellos son como on los encargados 18th Street, de rescatar which are in las charge lenguas que of están perdiendo, rescuing the languages y ellos that are being pues lost. eh, están And muy abiertos they a are apoyar very open a cualquier to eh, support grupo any indígena que indigenous quiera group trabajar that en parte de su lengua. wants to Es casi work siempre on nosotros rescuing encontramos their language. a gente, So, por ejemplo, Almost, nosotras for mismas example, nosotros somos we always use ourselves as an example, un grupo which de were the voices of the indigenous, trabajado original por communities, in, co, indigenous nosotros communities un grupo de indígenas para who have been working la lengua, from la cultura, 2019, la comunidad, las buenas working costumbres the gastronomic de Brasil, and the y good ellos practices of les the gustamos original a communities. ellos We trabajar invite en parte, them conozcan to cómo go les gusta and hacer get to el know trabajo, how cómo we, son los cultivos in that place, y porque son las we mismas work personas with que our trabajan children, hasta which are the las generations, a las 4 de la mañana future para generations, dar clases, Saturdays in the morning to porque provide hay class. lengua in our own language for our ¿Qué children nosotros tenemos que trabajar why do en we have to work para que regardless nuestros hijos everybody es algo independently muy absurdo with their children ver it's a very curious Kusavi es information una lengua because muy in antigua Kusavi there are more than es decir 80 variants no of es this mal language que mi hijo it's not bad la that comunidad my child de sus compañeras learns no, the no lo es variants of my colleagues pero approach it's no not bad es importante but es que mi hijo it's aprenda important mi variante that my child learns my variant junto conmigo y yo quiero Because rescatar mi variante my child's communication entonces is with me, and tenemos I want to que rescue educar my a nuestros variant. hijos no solamente So a nuestros in hijos this sino place, también they a don't nuestras only learn compañeras my y enfermeras variant, también they learn the variants y es of importante my colleagues que as no well. pierdan So las variantes it's important conozcan to not lose la the variants diversidad que nosotros tenemos and for them y to know las the diversity that we have variantes as Nasa. y no quiere decir that que there exists, una hija that there are many tenga variants, quiere decir and it doesn't que mean that una one of them hija is the original tenga que haber existido one. It means that's a language that existed for thousands milenaria of years, y que podemos, and, some, tenemos la capacidad and that de we have the capability de absorber of cuando absorbing vayamos a las as many variants Entonces, as we want. una vez que So ellos absorben, también once nosotros they como get adultos there, they, they are open tomar to las clases sitting down de, and receiving the cuando class, vayamos los niños que just tengan like variantes any de cualquier one of the students tipo, that might arrive at that moment. Eh, As a matter chicos of fact, de otros países, we've also asiáticos, had children from other countries, eh, like Asian el mismo students. director de la, de The, la organización the director de la Unesco, himself es un of this güerito, organization es un güerito, podemos decir, is, he's que a güerito, él aprendió we could Kusabi. say that, and Entonces, he's learned yo creo Kusabi. que hay So como ese a nivel I think de los that pueblos en donde there nosotros are many examples hacemos where talleres, hacemos we conferencias, have workshops, we have está presentations, bien porque los compañeros and de it's ellos open tienen for the cualquier public tipo so de they can, trabajo so they y can cualquier realize actividad how we can que work necesitamos with the community hacer como maestros and that we don't have to be poder certified hacerlo porque teachers nosotros to do mismos so because somos We los ourselves, profesores de nuestra lengua we are the ones that y no know hay our otra knowledge, persona que pueda that there decir is no que other es más person profesional that can de nosotros say that's more que professional nosotros hablamos we la are, lengua y no puede because nadie we speak their hablar language, nuestra propia and lengua. nobody can, nobody can certify us in our own language. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, I hear that, especially with indigenous languages, there's so much diversity. Like you mentioned, Josefina, in, in Mixteco, there are many different variants. Um, so the next question kind of asks, is there a good data source about indigenous languages most frequently spoken in the U.S.? Um, not sure if who would like to take that one. ¿Cuáles son de las lenguas que más se hablan aquí en Which Estados are Unidos? the languages that are most spoken here in the U.S.? Did I understand Yes. the correction? <laughs> yes, which indigenous language is the most spoken in the U.S. if there's a data source that exists? Bueno, yo creo que he escuchado mucho Well, acerca de I've heard a lot about Nahuatl, y, pero también hay muchos nasavis. but there are also many Hay nasavis. muchos nasavis en There are many California nasavi y en el estado in the de state California. of California Entonces, and in New York. no sé si ese es So... de la lengua nasava, pero I don't know if it's from my own porque perspective, no hemos but hablado I, de la porque hemos why do I mention ella a y lot? no tenemos a la Because mano. it's the resource Entonces, that we si have no hemos trabajado right por there. ahí, It's who we've worked se with ha creado for un mapa many years. We've created donde a map podemos ver where we can dónde see están ubicados where los grupos indígenas the con indigenous lenguas groups are located en el and estado their languages de Nueva York. in the state of New No York. estoy segura si es para I'm todo not el país, pero 100, desde I'm not el entirely estado sure de if Nueva it's for York, the entire country, but in the state sí of New hay York, una where we live, que podemos there is a map accesar. that No you can tengo have la access. mano de información, I don't have pero the hay information muchos testimonios with me right en, now, en Google, but I think un that mapa de lenguas if you indígenas look con in, lenguas if indígenas, you search in Google, las lenguas like indígenas the map of con indigenous lenguas languages indígenas, ¿cuál? by Podemos ELA, ver este mapa you can donde see están this ubicados map los where las diferentes all culturas the different y diferentes cultures idiomas que existen and different en, languages en el estado de Nueva York. 
maternal languages are located here in the state of New York. Thank you. Um, can you, oh, it looks like for anyone who's interested, the link was posted in the chat. So feel free to take a look at that. And regarding, um, I guess, different locations, like that's for New York, but uh, just I in living in areas that are very heavily populated, like um, New York or Los Angeles, um, how when you encounter people in your from your community or maybe from a different community who are only indigenous language speakers they don't speak english they don't speak spanish um, how do you see that impact their access to resources or the challenges they face with governments or non-government institutions Eso es para mí. Disculpe. It, for, either, for, me? <laughs> for either um, Josefina or Claudia, whoever would like to answer that. This is one of the questions we received from the, the audience. Um, if you've observed that or if you've seen how um, indigenous people who only speak their language or who don't speak English or Spanish, um, what are the type of challenges do you see them face when they try to access resources to government or non-government institutions? Bueno, para empezar, yo creo que sí es un este una responsabilidad. To begin with, I do think it's a responsibility for us who are who are interpreters to contact an institution or, in this case, uh, an a institution that can offer this. It's called accompaniment. It's called a, what is done with these people is called accompaniment. The network of people do so. We accompany a person when this person does not understand the language. They only speak their maternal language. And this service is completely free, where it could be an interpreter in their own language that accompanies that person wherever they have to go to any government institution for whatever service they need to accompany them. However, this service is not a formal interpretation as if it were from the institution. So it's also important for the state or for the organizations to have this resource for these people. If they don't have this resource, then linguistic justice is not being done in this organization. I also think that taking seriousness regarding doing things well should be a fundamental part for the organizations that if you are talking about linguistic justice, be able to provide the service for the people because it's very important. We haven't seen, we've seen this not only here, but in Mexico as well. However, the network of transnational people have worked binationally here in Mexico in order to do if there is a problem that is related with people that live here and there, they can create that link and they can work in both countries. But what's most important is for this person to receive that accompaniment to be able to, we can ensure that they have that linguistic, proper linguistic justice or the government services. Thank you. Thank you, Josefina. And I know, Claudia, you had mentioned about um, classrooms and how Garifuna is being taught in classrooms. We do have a question from the audience about how does a space for Indigenous interpreter training look like? Um, would it be like classrooms, uh, workshops, and why are those important? And how does that contribute to language justice? Sí, más que todo, esas son, son yes. programas que implementó el gobierno. Most of all, these are two programs eh, implemented by the government for all the all the schools in the Garifuna communities where existía una hora there was a specific hour para dar esas, esas to clases. provide these classes. Eh, it was like a, a rehearsal of sorts, but for some reason, they discontinued this project. 
And I hope that we have some national organizations where we can request the service once again, because as I mentioned previously, it's something that is it's going to contribute a lot to preserving and transmitting obligatory this the Garifuna language in the Garifuna's classrooms in the Garifuna communities at a national level. Thank you. And I think just going back to how we are able to continue um, giving the rights for for indigenous language um, in general language access how do we do that how do we find interpreters how do we find translators that are qualified um, we do have a question that says what are good training resources for certified translators in indigenous languages so i want to be careful um, just to kind of highlight uh, in the u.s um, versus Mexico or uh, Honduras or another country, um, I guess we can also answer, is there a certification process? And if there is, where can you find um, a good resource to find these interpreters and translators? Bueno, aquí en Estados Unidos como tal, Here in the U.S., for us, for, for us qualified interpreters, because we are qualified the interpreters that work here in these areas, whether judicial or social or medical areas, we are qualified. We know that there is not a, there is no certification itself, but we, there is an acknowledgement that Seattle is working to make this possible in the future. In Mexico, there is Vinali, and there are other institutions that can provide the certification. However, there's one question that we always ask ourselves. How is a university going to certify us, like, for example, the state of New York, that does not know our language, that they don't know that there are 80 variants? They would have to have a teacher in each variant for, to be able to say that we are the ones that are prepared or not to do so. It should be somebody that and an indigenous organization that is truly focused on working on these linguistic rights. Not an institution, not a government institution that is not prepared for this. However, I do think it's important to find out how Cielo has worked in all of these areas and with all these aspects in order to be able to do the certification. And we have to be very careful when we talk about doing a certification because we don't really know if this certification will be a good certification to do the interpretation because as interpreters, we have to have something that I've always said, which is ethics. We can't do the interpretation if there is not awareness that we're gonna do something good. Cielo has done, has given a lot of material for people to prepare themselves and something that has not been done by any other organization. Many times they, they take Cielo material to reproduce it, which is good, but we have to recognize that the, the matrix of all of this is Cielo. So we have to work, we have to work together if we want to achieve important goals for the communities and not have our own interests, instead a common interest, that we are truly working for the, the community, in, not just looking for certification, instead raise awareness that this is a work of, of values and ethics. Thank you, Josefina. I think that's a lot... Um a lot to say of like how do communities work right i'm um, following community protocol and that's something that i appreciate working with other indigenous interpreters how we can understand that um and and claudia i'm curious to know uh for garifuna is there a certification process for interpreters for translators and has the garifuna community um 
created a source that would be good to to take a look at if we're trying to find an interpreter or translator. A nivel de lo que es nuestro país con el idioma garífuna. When it comes to my country in the garífuna language, eh, it is a mismo. work. It is a continuous work, and an ongoing work, and by volunteer workers who are focused on going and increasing the new knowledge that arises in the Garifuna, new vowels that when it comes to migration, when it comes to technology, to justice. However, as Garifuna people, we have, we obtained great success, for example, in translation of the Garifuna Bible. That is something that is, it was a work that lasted several years. We're talking between the 80s and 90s, where work was done to translate the Garifuna Bible. And it's something that I consider was formidable work where not only Honduran Garifunas, but also Garifunas from Guatemala, participated, just to mention one example, and also Garifuna from Belize also. It's a great achievement, as I mentioned, and we are qualified. We are qualified when it comes to Garifuna translators. We have the capability. We're not certified by a specific organization, whether it's a governmental institution or not. However, as I mentioned previously, it's an ongoing work where every day there are new challenges. However, it's work that has to be done with a lot of responsibility, with a lot of with a lot of seriousness, because our from our work, the freedom depends on our work. Health depends and the progress of our people depends on the work that we do. Thank you. And um, I think this comment from Alfredo really underlines that how he says that two big challenges are the frequent that there is frequently very limited information um, in indigenous languages that are most spoken in their geographic area. And because of that, there is a limited number of qualified translators in their language. I think that goes the same for, um, we have a comment here for from Eugenia, that there are many different types of indigenous languages, but people are dedicated to work, um, guessing work outside of uh, language work, and they no longer put interest into uh, the different indigenous languages. And then for the same reason, there is no economical support I think, um, Josefina, as you mentioned, um, depending on the institution, are they putting in the effort to create that language access in their in their institution? And because there's no economical support in this country or in that institution, um, you can't work, you can't earn an income, and you can't pay your expenses. Um, so with that, with that being said, it becomes a challenge, right? It becomes a challenge to um, advocate when there's no budget, when interpreters are asked to um, volunteer. But at the end of the day, we all have bills to pay, right? But at, there's also the aspect of it's a right. It has to, there has to be a way where we can implement these change. Um, and then we have this other question where the issue of people understanding the concept of waiving their rights, it seems very complicated, but it's important. And can you talk more about um, possibly the difference in terms of individual rights as we see here in the justice system and how you might deal with them as an interpreter? Well, when... Bueno, se supone que nosotros como well, intérpretes, supposedly we interpreters, we are only a bridge, a communication bridge. We cannot, at that moment, when we cannot see when somebody's rights or individual rights are being violated, 
we can't speak up and say, oh, you can't do that because of the ethics. However, in forums such as this one, and as also the training when we have workshops, it's important to mention, I've, I've seen the situation. So, in forums such as this one, and in forums when we have communication with our directors and our leaders and our governments and the counterpart that should do the change when it comes to human rights, we have to communicate what are the barriers that exist in the, with indigenous communities. What are the challenges that we interpreters have and how can we create this change? This is where we have to raise our voice and be able to speak about what are the problems with community. However, with the people, the only thing that we can do is to raise our awareness in our people and tell them, hey, you have rights, because we already know this. However, maybe these people don't know this. So, for example, in, in the voices of the people, which are which is us, the women, we talk a lot about the rights of the women and the different types of violence that exist in the indigenous communities. In the case of the Nasavis, how the rights of the women and the children are vulnerated, women in general, and how we can say enough and what are the places we can turn to for this to change. Even if we don't live in Mexico, we know that violence is a com comes with us when we arrive at this country and unfortunately for indigenous women there is not one specific place where we can go to and where we don't where our word will be taken for as the truth so for us for us to be able, we need proof and to have that proof it's they're trampling on our rights as women we've already we've already we, assault to be raped so we have to raise awareness in the women regarding what is violence and how can we how can they defend themselves and it's not only in that area but we're also talking about the complete family because men are also men can also suffer violence children as well elderly people there's a, it's a group of vulnerable people for this, if we're talking about individual rights. But not only individual rights, there are also fundamental rights, human rights. And we, as people that know about this, we don't only work with, with a one group of rights. We also we work in a general area regarding what we about where we know what we can do and we can do a lot. However, it's not in our hands. It's in our hands of our leaders and our governments to create this change. But from what we can do, we do as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and it looks like we have ran out of time. So I think one of the biggest takeaways that we learned from Josefina and Claudia is that this isn't just um, access or this isn't just a service. This is a fundamental human right to give interpretation, to give access to information in the person's uh, native language. Um, and that the, it's important to work with interpreters who are trained because um, there are a set of ethics to be followed. So thank you. Thank you so much, Josefina and Claudia. It was really great learning from y'all to hear for y'all to share your knowledge with us. And thank you to the participants for today's attendance. And I would also like to thank um, Diego for the interpretation for today um, for English and Spanish. Um, and with this, we conclude our, our event. Um, this conversation invites us to reflect on the importance of language rights, recognizing that Indigenous people have the rights to express themselves in their languages in critical spaces such as healthcare, where language barriers between health personnel and Indigenous patients limit access to quality care. So ensuring the presence of specialized interpreters not only facilitates clear and uh, equitable communication, it also contributes to reducing inequities in health, in immigration services, and access to justice, among other essential areas. Uh, thank you so much again, everyone, for participating 
today. You will join the Osamasa in Chavila Ba. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, eh, Cielo, por habernos invitado a todos los que han Thank participado. you very much, Cielo, for inviting us. Muchas gracias a todos por estar aquí hoy. Thank you very much to everybody for being here. And I think it's very important that we did this. We are all learning and able to listen to, to hear from everybody. People can hear what we do and to be able to share what we do and learn, learn from one another. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Gracias. Que tenga un buen día.